Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful introduction. I, uh, I have spent the majority of my life in Palm Bay Extension right now, and I, I moved here in 1995. Well, I moved here in 95. My daughter was born two weeks later, and so I didn't start working in Palm Bay Extension again in Riverside until January 96. But um, Gary and I have worked together for many, many years. He's a delight. It's hard to follow a presentation by the He does a wonderful job. Um, and I, my background is plant pathology, but my work has been with uh, citrus, uh, citrus of crops. The last three positions have all been right around UCR, so I have sort of only moved to Southern California and never moved again. So I just have had my positions changed. So right now I'm the director of the research station. I'm also a 30% extension specialist in some tropical crops. And so uh, my passion is some tropical crops, and that keeps the rest of your job going, because you have that research and extension opportunities like this to, to share with people. So I, I'm over the research station, which is in Riverside proper and also out in Coachella Valley. The research station was founded in 1907. UCR, I believe, is the only UC campus with its own research station. The others, there's a, like the South Coast Rec Center over in um, Irvine. That's part of uh, ANR, which is the umbrella for the Quadra Extension programs. So we're unique, and we're also unique in the fact that UCR was first a research station and second a uh, campus. So in '54, it became a campus. The research station was founded because of a request from the people, the growers, to have a station where they could do research and testing and, and promote the citrus industry. And so Riverside won that bid and became a research station out of Berkeley, I think, was the original connection. And eventually it became a campus. The station was purchased from growers, and some of our trees are still there. They're over 125 years old. Um, so of them look 125 years old and they need to be removed, and others of them are really still going pretty strong. Some of the original research that was done by Fawcett and others that were part of the founding fathers of the research station, they did work on viroids and viruses of citrus. And those original trees with the original tags are still in there, and, and they're still thriving more or less, um, some of them thriving more. But the, the viroids are, are still there. They don't move unless you take budwood from there, and that was uh, the foundation of the coronal protection program, is the work here that said, you know, you can't just take a tree that looks healthy. Like Gary said, a sun blotch. If you take a healthy tree and you take buds off, but you don't know if it's symptomless carrier of a viroid. In the case with citrus, um, cirrhosis and concave gum were all, you could have asymptomatic carrier, it could be, have the virus but not express it until you bud it and then you sell all these trees and you spread it all over. So that was the base, that, the foundation of the clonal protection program was here. And the previous group didn't get to hear about that. <laughs> so you have something on it. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, so, Research on citrus was the whole focus. Now it's much broader. We have, um, we, we're the living laboratory, the outdoor laboratory for, for work that goes from engineering to biological sciences, social sciences, and, and uh, the core agriculture like um, plant pathology, entomology, nematology. We have a new garden and that's bringing the social sciences into it. We have research projects that are looking at weed composition within community gardens and how that affects, I don't know what, but <laughs> <laughs> you get it. There's a wide range of, of research opportunities here. Uh, and we're still relevant to uh, biotechnology because most biotech eventually have to have an application. And having a secured site with a fence, we are able to post biotech projects and assure the you know, USDA that that projects are being cared for and they're not going to be tampered with should, should there be a need to have that kind of research. We also are beyond agriculture. We do turf grass, ornamentals, 
and uh, landscape. <coughs> so I, I just, to me, this is a great place because it integrates all the sciences and all the disciplines, and we get a lot of cross disciplinary work. So we have two field stations, one in use with you here, and that's 480 acres, and then we have a research station out in Coachella Valley, which was purchased in 1990. Um, there was one in Marino called the Marino Field Station, which was east of Marino Valley. That was sold, and the, and the Coachella Valley was purchased in, as a replacement. And it, the nice thing is that Coachella provides a desert environment, and this provides a, not really coastal, but certainly less, uh, much less of a desert than the Coachella Valley for different environments. This is just a, a Area, uh, overview map from Google Maps where they cross highlighted. So we have avocados, and this is actually avocados now. Um, row crops, we have, this is a, a riparian community. So they're looking at population dynamics and pests and whatnot within a, a you know, a river bottom type mm -hmm. plant. Uh, this is asparagus breeding, and then we have, this is a biocontrol grower, which is just next door to us here. And it's not organic, it's a biocontrol. We use it for entomology research. Much of the biotope, in the infancy of biocontrol for insects, it began here. And that research ground was established to do research to find parasites to, you know, we don't have any pesticide applications up there other than organically approved. And up until Asian citrus psyllid came in, there wasn't any organic or non-organic or any pesticide sprays up there other than maybe spraying the weeds on the head headline to keep the weeds down. Uh, but with Asian citrus soda, we do have to control. Um, and so we use organic. The efficacy, you know, we need to spray a lot. Uh, and then we have turf and ornamental, and we're actually expanding the turf into a, they're expanding into a breeding program. So tree crops, we have we have grape vineyards, and this is the focus of Pierce's disease research, and I'll show you that in a minute. But we have quite a bit of vines right now. This is a tango, which is you know when you go to the store and you buy cuties or halos at this time of year, it's a different variety than if you bought them in December. In December they're clementines, and they either put cloth over the trees to keep the bees out, or they plant in isolation and hope there's no bees around to cross pollinate. Well, the fruit that are in there now are most likely tangos. They could be W. Burcott that is being um, raised in isolation, or they're tangos. Tangos are already came from uh, UC Riverside. Mike Bruce's breeding program, what he did is he took W. Burcott, irradiated buds, planted out a thousand, waited to see if they fruited, and selected a tree that had high quality food that was seedless and uh, productive. And that's what you have in most of those cutie or halo boxes, and that's tango. Mm -hmm. So we have a small grove of tangos that was supposed to make us millions. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting, but they sell very well. We just only have a, a few acres that when they said, let's plant this, it will make you millions. They use it for research and we pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out quite the way it should. Um, Excuse me, is tango triploid and that's why it's dependent we see this? No, the, when they raise the blood, they knock out the gene for seeds. Oh, so it's diploid. Oh. Okay. Yeah, like seedless tissue, that's a triploid and that's seedless, but in this case it's... Because the TDE mandarin hybrids are triploid and right. I was led to believe that was why they were seedless. Right. Those are triploid and they are seeds. But this one can have seeds, it won't have very many. It's, it's less than the low seeded. Low seeded, I think it's <coughs> or fewer seeds per fruit. And this is certainly less than one per fruit. Occasionally you'll find one that has more. And the seed is tissue? Um, I, I was thinking that's triploid, I'm not sure. I don't know the source. I think you have had people ask me if, if, if that's defined as genetically modified. No, it's not genetically modified. Um, in nature, you'll have bud mutations, and you, you, have, you have the seedless, uh, you have navel oranges, and that was a bud mutation, and the fruit on that were um, seedless. And so this was accelerated by using um, 
radiation on the buds, so you accelerated what sunlight could do in a laboratory setting, and you certainly could blast a lot more buds, but it's not technically genetically modified because you're not inserting any new genes, you're not manipulating it any other way than what could naturally happen. Mm -hmm. I've had people ask that question, we had a sustainability conference, and most of the people on that conference were very anti um, GMOs. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and we drove by the tangos and we stopped and ate some and they were all, and they were asking about it and I said it was a radiated buzz. <laughs> so it's not, it's not genetically modified, you're okay, you can eat the fruit. You can eat the fruit even if it was genetically modified, but we won't go there today. <laughs> So we also have avocados. We have a collection of avocado varieties with Mary Lou Arpaez. Uh, this is a picture from the uh, planting the uh, Mike Cleggs, where they planted out every single seed from one Gwen tree. And they thought it hadn't been cross-pollinated. They were wrong, but it, um, I'm not sure why they didn't think it was cross-pollinated. But it had been. There's only a few of those trees in this night. A uh, couple acre block, block, there's several hundred trees there. There's only a couple of them that were self. But they were able to, to do gene chips to map out uh, phenotypic characteristics. So fruit shape, color, trees, leaf color, shape, all those details, they can link to genes from that, from that research plot. We have a date variety collection out in the desert, over 100, 120 different date varieties. And these are dates that represent the world's dates, some of which aren't available in the Middle East any longer, but they're available here. Mm -hmm. And that's that's actually USDA's uh, collection that we're the stewards of. Mm -hmm. Vegetable crop research, we have uh, all kinds of things at different times of the year, of course. But the asparagus breeding is also Mike Bruce's, and that's probably the largest, world's largest breeding program. They're harvesting right now, and it's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad I couldn't bring some. <laughs> Is there anything better than UC 157? You know what? I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I know that there's a number of things that are in the pike, and they're, they certainly look at different colors. There's some that are more of a pink, have some uh, different anthocyanin oh. pigments or whatever, but I don't know. And what we're getting is everything grouped together, so it's a, it's a mixture of varieties. Uh, we have a lettuce trial, and this was a pretty interesting trial. A seed company, a fertilizer company, wanted to know uh, what phosphorus formulation was the best. And so they took lettuce and we tested the ground to make sure it was fairly low in phosphorus. It hadn't been planted to a crop in several years. And he planted uh, lettuce, and it was remarkable the differences. The without phosphorus was 30-40% smaller than with phosphorus, and the different formulations had different results. So that's just a, you know, a, one of those questions that a homeowner's not going to call and ask you about, but they will ask you, do I need to put a starter down for vegetables? And, and you know, and vegetables, yes, you really do. And this this trial was pretty dramatic. We have vegetable crops uh, like. Uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> we have tomatoes. Like tomatoes. <laughs> Beans. But we, we have IR4 program. And the IR4 program is a federally funded program to help with registration of pesticides for specialty crops. Because a specialty crop is a small base. You don't have a lot of money behind it. And so you don't have groups that are going to sponsor registration of a, of a chemical. And the big companies aren't going to spend millions on a, on a crop that they won't get a lot of uh, revenue from. You know, compare soybeans to, um, to kiwi fruit. You know, you, you have different orders of magnitude. So this program assists in, in developing the pesticides for registration. So we have, uh, uh, the, we're one of the iron four sites, so we have various vegetables year-round where they're putting out pesticides and just setting them in for analysis for residues to make sure that's safe. Uh, we have a cooperation with Del Monte. We're planting beans for seed 
um, increase. So they can accelerate their breeding program by having a winter site where they're, well, actually, we can grow beans year-round out in the desert. So they can get several generations from us where, in Wisconsin, where their headquarters is. Well, you, can, you can do the math. We can do more here. <laughs> Uh, the citrus variety collection is here, and the tango is represented in that collection, and so is the, the parent, which is W. Murcott. W. Murcott came out of Morocco, and it is a delicious fruit, but it's seedy. Um, she, Tracy Kahn is a curator of the variety collection. There's over a thousand different citrus types, citrus relatives, um, and of those 1,850 of them are things that we use for food. And these are a few just pictures. This is a Buddha's hand, which is a fingered citron. That's, of course, not edible, unless you just want to dice it up and put it in date bread. I'm not sure you could, but <laughs> it's very pretty. It's a nice uh, table ornament. Uh, you have this, I believe, is a valentine, which is a new product from UCR. It's a hybrid between pumelo, blood orange, and I think mandarin, but I'm not sure about that. And it ripens at Valentine's Day. And if they turn it over, it's yeah, it's like heart shaped, and the blood orange gives it that, that color. It, it's really a nice fruit. It is a variegated lemon. But this is a resource not only for breeders, but also uh, Tracy has an agreement with Jibidon, which is a flavor company. I think I, we have speaker problems. Um, it's a flavor company, and they come throughout the year and take fruit at different stages and extract different um, compounds that give, give the citrus flavor. So when you go to the store and you see citrus whatever, and, and Jibidon has done demonstrations, and I think one of them, well, well Gatorade, citrus flavored Gatorade, I don't know if that's a Jibidon product, but it has citrus flavorings in it. They wouldn't tell us which were theirs, but they gave us about 20 different examples of going down the, off the shelf of citrus flavoring and, and they had derived their, their compounds from the variety collection of different types. Uh, turf and ornamentals, we have a new breeding program and they're expecting to have about 10 acres of turf in the future right now. The, the breeding program only has a couple acres and that represents us going in. And we have sports turf evaluations and you know, when you think about your lawn versus the soccer field, your lawn takes some traffic, but the soccer field and football field has to be very durable. And the person that preceded me in, in my position, he was a turf expert, and he developed a machine that would simulate um, traffic, so they call it a traffic simulator. And so you roll this thing across the ground, and it, it makes an impact of, of, you know, 200, 300 pound football players running across it. And so they can decide which turf species is, is going to hold up better. And it, I, you know, I, I like my lawn. We play in the lawn, but I've never, never really thought about what goes behind the breeding of the perfect lawn. Uh, Steve had done a contract work with Angel, not Angel Stadium, he's worked with Angels, but Diamondback Stadium in Arizona. And when they were designing that new stadium, they needed to find a turf species that was take low light at different times because it's covered part of the day. And so they, he did all these experiments here and found the combination that had, had the durability to take the traffic as well as the reduced light. And I, that, that's a cool story. <laughs> um, we have ornamental trials, not very many. This is a water use experiment where they're using cover crops and they're, over the course of four or five years, they slowly reduced the amount of water. So they did full ET, and then they reduced it down to like 25% for some of the plots and see how they have survived. And it's um, opportunities that we all need to be looking into for uh, water conservation. Pierce's disease is a big problem anywhere you have grapes and like Temecula they were predicting that there wouldn't be any grapes by now. Fortunately the glass wing sharpshooter isn't, um, isn't as adaptable. And they found that if you put a barrier it flies in the barrier it won't go over the barrier. So they've done some tricks in, in different areas to keep the sharpshooter out but mainly it's, it does well, um, it doesn't do well with pesticides. So. 
we have plenty of Pearson's disease bacteria and plenty of the sharpshooters. And so the research folks up at Davis collaborate with us and put out these trials. And this is symptoms that you would see in July, August, September of infected vines. This is one of the vineyards. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at um, novel ways injecting bacteria into the plants to see if it will prevent infection. Um, do funny things where we shade the plant, we keep the insects out or keep them in depending on what you, <laughs> what you want. <laughs> With the Asian citrus psyllid, that has had an impact on the glassy sharpshooters, so the grape guys aren't too happy about all the spraying we do for Asian citrus psyllid, but we have to. And uh, one, of the, one of the researchers is trying different approaches to not controlling the disease or the insect, but how do you live with HLV and ACP like they are trying to do in, in Florida? And so there's these high density trials. He's looking at different root stocks, and these are on raised bed. That's about an 18 inch bed. It's originally, it's kind of settled down a little bit. But what's happened is this, these trees have put on fruit at, uh, about two years ahead of the flat planted. Trial. And so as, as really, if you have HLB, you're not going to have a tree for after infection much more than five years. So let's assume that you have two years of no disease and then it comes in, you can pull a tree out after seven years and it recoups some of your costs for yield. So that's a high density this way and here they're screening it with um, trellising and I would, these are around I think it's about six feet. It may not be six feet apart. It's probably less than that, huh, Gary? Those are probably four foot density, and it's similar here, but these are going to be um, single leader. So they want to increase productivity by getting the bud, the growing tip away from the roots. You think you'll get productivity faster. And so that's, that's a faster way of, this, this trial is actually a faster way to screen for seedless fruit. They want to push them into production. But another side, side benefit would be um, to increase production faster so that you could turn around crops if you had infection. And our friend, the uh, Asian, or not friend, Asian citrus <laughs> psyllid, this, this leaf is of particular importance. Um, it's, it's the first sign I look for when, I, when I'm looking for Asian citrus psyllid. You see the little bend in the leaf? Mm -hmm. Well, that leaf was being fed on by adults when it was more like this size. And, and it caused the toxins in the saliva caused the leaf to, to grow differently. And so you'll see that little bend. And that's a, when I first saw Asian citrus psyllid, that's a, that's a first character I could pick up on. Your eyes eventually get used to looking for the psyllids, which are fairly big compared to the nymphs. They're usually not in this high density, thankfully, because it's easier to see when you see all these nymphs and all the honeydew coming off of them, which comes off in little spirals, little white spirals. Uh, we do have psyllids here. We spray <coughs> routinely. Um, there's a large program working at biocontrol. They're releasing tamarixia, which controls the first couple of NSARs. They're looking at other biocontrol agents, but you cannot live with um, Asian citrus psyllid and rely only on biocontrol. It takes very few psyllids to transmit the bacterium. So you need, but in areas where you don't have an option to spray, they're hoping to inundate those with the biocontrol to at least hold the population down and away from the commercial groves. We are, we cover all of our acres and therefore the state will come in and spray a buffer around us. So there's a 400 meter buffer that the state sprays to help protect our collection. So, if I could ask a question, the sort of the strategy seems to be to plan a <coughs> short life for citrus as opposed to a longer life for citrus. Well, that's that's um, the only option if you don't have a way of controlling the bacterium and you're not controlling the psyllid. Like in, in Florida, they let the psyllid get away, not realizing that the bacterium was already there. They thought, well, we can live with the psyllid. <laughs> well. By the time they discovered that they had the bacterium, it had spread, and now I've heard estimates of 100% infection. Yeah, you never have 100%, but it's, it's awfully high, and so the productivity of citrus coming from Florida is going to be lower and lower and lower 
um, the flavor changes. And so if you do taste scenes, you know, save some frozen orange juice, and then in a few years pull out the, the stuff they're selling you from Florida, it'll either be augmented from other areas or the flavor changes because it becomes less sweet. It has an off flavor. <coughs> and so, and I don't know, consumers over time will adapt their taste buds to a little bit less quality. I know when we taste orange juice here, you don't want to buy anything out of the freezer or the shelf when you squeeze your own orange juice. So I don't think we'll ever totally adapt to a different change. But we have to do our part to keep the psyllis down, otherwise we're going to be in Florida's position. There is research down the road and that goes back to GMOs and so that when, when the world doesn't have citrus anymore, I think they'll think more timely of having a spinach gene inserted into the rootstock which would prevent HLG. Uh, if I talk to root rot, this station is invested with Phytophthora root rot which is a citrus form. It's a different species than the avocado root rot and so Every avocado, or citrus grove, an avocado grove for that matter, will have some level of root rot in there. And this station, we have our, it was originally furrow irrigated, and uh, we still have that system, and we recover the tailwater and circulate it back through. It's circulated a small percentage, but you have the potential of spreading phytophthora, and it is everywhere. But it's okay to do a root rot study here because we already have the phytophthora. <laughs> so they're um, actually not, they're pouring in you know, 100 mils of, of phytophthora zoospores as they plant so they can increase the amount of disease and, and evaluate fungicides. <laughs> we also have um, this picture here that was supposed to be an avocado root rot study. And the researcher, um, was getting ready to inoculate the trees and I came on board just before that and I said, you know, we can't live with phytophthora root rot on avocados. We don't have it on the station. We have, you know, probably 50 acres of avocados. We don't want to have to be fighting root rot. And so I said, sorry, I know this is a hardship, but you can't, you, this isn't, you can't do that. <laughs> so he didn't inoculate the trees. And so I uh, converted it into a salinity trial because it's the same root stocks. We need them to be root rot tolerant and we need them to be tolerant to salts. Mm -hmm. And so that root rot study became a salinity trial. And this is a tank. That's just a sand base. It's not really salts. <laughs> 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 and our, our guy in the garage rigged up this. So you swing it over and you can drop the salts in. And nobody has back injuries. And this is oh, really nice. nifty. Mm -hmm. And so this trial is only the first year of adding salts, the picture was taken before the salts were added. We have a nice mulch, Gary. The trees really struggled until we, when I took it over, I, I said, let's, let's grow avocados the Gary way. And so we put the wood mulch down and, and what a huge difference. If you have avocados, if people have avocados that are struggling, if you get a wood mulch under there, it's, the response of the tree is, is incredible. Um, salinity trial for turf, those are salt tanks and they irrigate and you can see the highest concentrated salts are over here in the corner and it's a gradation and they're looking at you know, suitability of turf and, and saline conditions. And then this is a great trial just over the hill here and they're looking at in infiltration and salt movement in the soils. Mosquito research, we have a world renowned researcher Bill Walton and he has ponds, and there's mosquitoes out there. And you can see these little dots on the water. Nymphs, the are they? Larvae? Larvae. Swimming around. I'm not there at night, so I don't know how bad the mosquitoes are, but during the day, they're OK. <laughs> but they're doing biocontrol work, looking at controlling mosquitoes uh, using different methods, uh, I'm sure a wide range of things from CT to um, uh, other parasites. And then lastly, we have a student garden. When I first came on board, the student gardens was over by fleet services and they needed the land for something else. So they pulled it out and actually when we first moved here, it was a weedy patch over by the freeway. As you get off the freeway at Martin Luther King, it was a community gardens and it was 
a really a weed patch. And that's what we don't want. The students had it in another site. They needed that site for another reason, so they pulled it, and the students were, we need to have a community garden. So I, I asked the question, why don't we have it where we have other crops? And so I dedicated a six-acre block for the community, for the student garden. And uh, this is just what, after it opened, it is now, it's still being developed. They're going to use different circle as a circles. It's really a beautiful configuration on paper. It, it will be beautiful when it's all planted, but they'll use different ecosystems or different plant types. There'll be a, a medicinal plant circle. So it'll give opportunities for research or for just uh, asking questions and teaching classes. Uh, we, last year we did a special event for at-risk youth out of San Bernardino, and these kids, uh, what a great day for them. They learned, they planted seeds, most of them are not growing up in circumstances that any of us have ever been in. Some of them, the only meal they were going to get was from that program that day. And so we provided them with fresh produce, showed them the variety collection, which you guys will see today. Uh, taught them about planting, eating healthy, a little bit about research, and it was a great opportunity. And Fortino is here, and he is the garden manager, and he does quite a lot of K-12 outreach. And also we have student classes out in the garden for UCR classes. Um, CSERT, which is environmental, it's not environmental sciences, it's an engineering group, and what they're doing is, uh, with a grant from student fees, they build a solar generator that, so they'll have events and they'll run 10 smoothie machines off the solar <laughs> generator, they'll use a solar generator for events throughout the campus, but it, it's out in the garden as well, so that they um, can host events without electricity. So our little, so it's our little sustainability cor corner. So we have solar water pump for irrigation. We have a solar generator to turn on lights, or we'll be putting in a classroom with solar power. And then the, uh, we're putting in a solar farm just to the north of that that will help offset power at the campus. So that's, that's it. Any questions?